welcome to what I think now is about the 38th or 39th annual Conference on Aging that is co-sponsored by the Department of Veterans Affairs Geriatric Research Education and Clinical Center and the Geriatric Education Center at the Health Science Center. I'm Michelle Saunders. I direct the Geriatric Education Center. I'm here to welcome you on behalf of both the Health Science Center and the VA. Thank you all so much for coming. Uh, it's going to be a busy day. People will be coming and going all day, so try not to be disturbed by the folks around you as they get up and have to go back to clinic and so forth. If you would get out your handout, your spiral bound handout. Uh, those of you who were here yesterday were here for the Medico Legal Conference. Today you flip it over for the annual conference and I'll take you through the very first few pages. Um, as, you, as you open it, um, you've got welcome letter, um, event schedule, and continuing education is probably the most important part that um, we're going to talk about a little bit after the schedule. And before I do that, I wanna thank the planning committee and they're listed also in the handout. We have a tremendous planning committee we do every year, which is why we have A-rated fabulous conferences every year. And in addition, we have our stream team in the very back as you came in, if you got some coffee or fruit or whatever, um, you will have passed them. And that's Javier Escamilla, who I see, oh, Bob Merrill, um, the two of them who get everything going, my staff, out in front, those of you who uh, registered and spoke with Barbara Giles, the silver-haired lady, if you have any questions um, about what forms you should or should not have filled out, you can ask her, or Jose Zapata, who is our conference coordinator. Mark Johnson up front is doing, um, as you know, many of you for many years now, uh, the DVD, CD production, and uh, we're also streaming this conference live. So there are participants at VAs and other areas uh, all around the state. Uh, lastly, there is a form a couple of pages back, which is a participant profile. If you have never filled one out, please fill one out. The reason we're able to do this for 30 some odd years is because we get funding because of the data we provide. Your name never goes anywhere. You may be one of 3,000 nurses in a given year, and all you are is a nurse in, in that who works at the VA or who works at a community health center or who works at a hospital. We need you to fill this out because then we can put the data in that keeps us funded um, we have to report that data with nameless data, just so you're aware of that. But we have to know that you have filled out one of these, and that's why we require your name, so that we know that you filled one out. Because once you fill one out, you never have to fill one out again. So if you've never done it, please do it today. We really need it. Um, and if you've done it before, that's one less thing you have to do today. After that, there is the conference CD DVD order form. And um, I'm going to uh, uh, leave the next, um, well, actually, one more thank you to our v VA staff who are here. We have uh, Tressa Edwards and um, Veronica Salazar from the VA who are also working the tables outside. Please stop by all the vendors if you can. You have a little yellow slip of paper if you haven't get one from Barbara from the desk. You go to each vendor, you get it stamped, we have some phenomenal um, door prizes at the end of the day, uh, and you have to be here to get one. They're great gifts as well as things for yourself. Uh, and Joe Zapata now is going to take over for me uh, and introduce our um, keynote and uh, our two MCs, Byron Cordes and Helen Flores. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, just a quick reminder that if you need to use the restroom, it's going to be out this door to the right, and it'll be on your right-hand side down this hallway right here. So everybody needs to use that. So go ahead and excuse yourselves at any time. Uh, of course, an important aspect of the conference is attaining your CEUs. Um, 
we have two entities that are supplying CEUs, the VA and us, the University of Texas Health Science Center. And uh, on one of their pages here behind uh, the statement of attendance form uh, is the instructions how to attain your CEUs. If you're trying to attempt, or if you're uh, trying to attain your medical credits, nursing credits, or APA credits, you must go through the TMS. If you're part of the VA system, you know all about TMS. If you're not employed by the VA, you're not, maybe not familiar with the TMS system, so what you have to do is go to the front desk, fill out a non-VA registration request form, uh, uh, fill it out, bring it back to us, and uh, you will receive uh, further instructions via email. Now, if you're trying to uh, gain activity directors, ALM, certificate of attendance, guardianship, or not guardianship, uh, LNFAs, uh, LPCs, or social work credits, regardless if you work for the VA or not, you'll be going through University of Texas. Also, all you have to do is uh, fill out this form right here. It's located in your booklet and turn this in at the very end of the conference. I will not accept it beforehand, only at the very end. And of course, if anybody has any questions uh, regarding CEUs, I'll be in and around, on the hallway, everywhere. So go ahead and uh, just pull me aside and uh, ask me any question you like, and I'll definitely, at the very least, point you in the right direction. So I would like to introduce you the, uh, the MCs for today. Uh, first of all is uh, Byron Cordes. He received his uh, master's in social work from Arden Lake uh, uh, University and has a Bachelor of Science in Psychology from Oklahoma State University. And he has worked for over 25 years in the social work field. His background includes uh, medical social work, case management, and clinical work with geriatrics. Byron is a licensed so clinical social worker and holds an advanced certificate, certification in social work case management. He currently owns and operates Sage Care Management, a professional geriatric care management agency providing education and, and support to seniors. He also, he's also a member of the American Society on Aging and the National Association of Social Workers. Byron has been married for 25 years and has one daughter, and he is active in several local community organizations and boards. Helen Flores, his partner, attained her BS in, in health from UTSA in 1998 and has been in the geriatric field since then. Always a care, a care supporter for her grandmother, it was natural for her to go into the field of elderly care. Helen started with her, started her career in retirement living, quickly moved to the Alzheimer's Association. While there, her own father was diagnosed with diabetic-related dementia. As a caregiver for him directly, then offering training and programming while at work, Helen found herself living the life that she was preaching about to others. The opportunity allowed Helen to transition her current position at Caring Companion, a local non-medical home health agency. There, Helen had the support of her organization to offer community education in the form of being an early stage support a group facilitator for those living with dementia. A master trainer for the stress busting program for family caregivers, certified trainer for the virtual dementia tour, and, a, and the chairman for the volunteer board of the Alzheimer's Association. Helen is celebrating her 20th anniversary this year with her husband and has an 11-year-old son. So please give them both a round of applause. Good morning. For those of you that were here yesterday, was it not a fantastic day? Yeah. I've been to several and I feel revigorated and energized with the information I uh, learned yesterday. So I am so honored to be in your presence today. By the way, I was Kathy's number one volunteer at the Alzheimer's Association when she worked there. I, I created that title. I don't know if she'll feel the same. But, um, and, and I need to tell you, Ms. Cockrell, as I was preparing to introduce you today, you have a very ecstatic fan in the audience here. Um, this person wants to meet you in person afterwards because the very first time she voted, guess who she voted for? You met her. Oh, she couldn't wait. Oh, I was trying to leave that in suspense. Okay, so 
Kelly Cross came up like she's a little schoolgirl saying, I'm so excited this, this morning. Well, in an effort to introduce a very popular woman here in San Antonio, I will give it my best. So Miss Lila Cockrell was a ensign in the WAVES. Does everybody know what the acronym WAVES stand for? Women Accepting Volunteer Emergency Services back in World War II. She worked for the Bureau of Ships out of Washington, D.C. After the war, her and her family moved to the Dallas area, and she served as the president of the League of Women Voters in the 50s. When the family came to San Antonio, she, gen uh, she then became the president of the San Antonio chapter of the League of Women Voters. Uh, that was in, from 59 through 63. Does that sound about right? Okay. This then followed consecutive terms as a San Antonio City Councilwoman and winning elections in 63, 65, 67, and in 60, 1969 by the year, the way that, that was the year I was born. And at that last term, she was um, designated as Mayor Pro Tem, retiring in 1970 to return to family life, being a private citizen, Actually, she was asked to come back into politics and returned for the 1973 electoral vote and for the fifth time was a councilwoman. In 1975, she was elected as mayor, serving three consecutive terms from 75 to 81, and then went once again back into private life. Came back to return to politics and she again um, ran for the fourth mayor mayoral term and was elected from 1989 to 1991. She continued her civic involvement and served as the president and the executive director for the San Antonio Park Foundation from 1968 to 2012. That's longevity. She's been officially given the title Mayor Emeritus um, by universe or unanimous vote by the City Council. So without further ado, may I please introduce Miss Lila Cockrell. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thanks. 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 Thank you. Well, let me say it's a great pleasure to be here with all of you young people. <laughs> and I'm going to be speaking from a little different perspective. I am going to be speaking from the point of view of a rather aged person. And all of you who are working on uh, the challenges of aging and being helpful to persons as they age, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about what it's like to move into being an older person. Person. Now, all my life, I have enjoyed being active. And uh, it just seems to be, I don't know if I was the girl who couldn't say no, but every time someone said, well, would you work in this, uh, on this effort or work on another effort or run for office or whatever, I always said, yes, that's going to be so much fun. That's going to be interesting. And then one of the things that I think is something that always keeps you alive all your life is if you enjoy people. If you truly like working with people. Getting to meet people with many different backgrounds, learning about them, interacting with them, trying to understand their point of view, and, and again, collaborating and, and having things that you can do and enjoy together. And that's something that as a person grows older, they really shouldn't lose. Now, we have all heard the sort of trite expression about moving into the golden years. Let me just say, first of all, at your age, you need to save more money <laughs> for your retirement. Fortunately, I did save a little along the way, so uh, my retirement is not uh, in any way hampered, but 
uh, I just want to say many people reach retirement age and are seniors and suddenly realize that would have been better for them if they have saved a little more money along the way because inflation comes along. And even though you may think you planned for things, uh, your costs don't go down dramatically when you suddenly retire. So as you work with older people, you will find that many have really challenges in terms of their uh, funding, their income. Now fortunately, I was a baby and then a child during the Great Depression. That was long before anybody else in this room was born or maybe even your parents were born. But I, I learned and absorbed, even though a child, I absorbed all the things you can do when there is a depression. My mother was a very uh, outgoing person and my uh, dad, my own father, had died, but I had a wonderful stepfather. And he was uh, an attorney, and he worked in the Treasury Department. And in the Treasury Department, they didn't just fire all their attorneys, but everybody went on half pay. So uh, mother accepted the challenge as the homemaker. And we had lots of uh, uh, spaghetti dishes and macaroni and cheese, and uh, jello for dessert, and we knew how to make do. Mother knew how to make do. She would still have little tea parties for the ladies at that time, and they would come to her home, to our home, and she would roll out her little Japanese tea cart, and she would have a hot pot of tea, and lemons, and clove, and a plate of cinnamon toast. And everybody enjoyed the lovely tea. But growing up in the Depression helped me understand more about how to cope when incomes go down and still keep a cheery outlook on life. Many people who have grown up in the age of continuing rise of salaries in good times don't understand that. So one of the things that persons need to do as they move ahead is to learn how to manage whatever funds they have, how to do it and not just feel sorry for themselves that they can't write every check and sign every check and still enjoy their lives. Now, another thing as you grow older, uh, you start having various little ailments. Uh, first, maybe you start needing glasses. I went through that spell, and now, of course, I have little enhancements implanted, you know, so I don't wear glasses, but you start having vision problems. And then pretty soon, you find yourself saying, do you mind speaking a little louder? Yes, and then pretty soon something hurts in your back. And it, um, could I possibly be getting arthritis? What, what's going on? And then you keep having birthdays. And uh, they keep coming around more often than you remember they did when you were a child. When you were a child, you look forward for a year to that birthday when you were going to have a party and make, get some presents. You know, when you get to be older, you don't always want to say, I'm having another birthday. <laughs> and so I've had 92 of them. So my next birthday in January, I will be 93. So, okay. But just remember, whatever that age is, you're still you. There's still many things you can do. You may even get to the point where your friends have noticed that you need a walker. Now, I came in with my walker. Up until a little over a year ago, I did not have a walker. I 
you know, was positive. I did not need a walker. I was not getting that old <laughs> to have a walker. However, uh, I have a very good friend, Rosemary Kowalski, who this year will be celebrating her 90th birthday. And so we go out to a lot of the same events, and she had noticed that sometimes I kind of caught on to somebody's arm when I was going across the street or, you know, just felt a little unsteady. So one day she called me and said, if you're home, my driver and I are going to drop by. Okay, we've got a little present for you. So she came in with the little present, my gift from Rosemary. Well, I had to start using it. I couldn't hurt her feelings when she had come by. Now, I have another friend, I might tell you, who is about three or four years older than I am, who still does not use a walker. However, we go out, she goes out to a lot of the same events, and she's hanging on an arm and stooped over, but she doesn't need a walker, she says. Now, I love my walker. I have really come to enjoy it. I call it my scooter. I get on that walker and I can go, 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 and it is wonderful. So I say just be happy that we have tools. If we need glasses, we take glasses. If we need hearing aids, we get hearing aids. If we have an ailment, we take the medicine. And so why not a walker? And I love my walker now, and I wish I had waked up and said, I need a walker even earlier, because it is great to go and not have to look around for somebody's arm. I can be independent with my walker. Now, I will tell you from an older person's point of view, there comes a little benefit also if you have one of these. You just mentioned to your doctor that you are now needing a walker, and he or she will give you a certificate that you take down and you get a disability parking that you hang on your little card. And I wish I had thought of that earlier because I have many times driven around and around and around, you know, arriving at the last minute at some event, and I saw longingly those disability spots right up by the front door, but I couldn't park because I didn't have one of those cards. Well, now I have one. And so uh, I drive up and look around, where is the disability parking? I am thrilled to have that little card to hang on my windshield. There are, however, some negative things, some unhappy things. And as counselors, as workers with persons who are moving into their golden years, uh, one of the things you have to cope with is loss, loss of friends. Loss of my husband was traumatic. And then, of course, loss of parents, loss earlier of grandparents, and then loss of your contemporaries who have predeceased you. And it, it really brings a lot of sadness and as you're working with people, just know that they have to find reinforcements. They have to keep expanding their group of friends. They have to cope with loss. And that is one area that I think many people uh, work through, but it's still always there. Each time a loved friend moves on. And so one of the things that I have enjoyed is having a pet. I'm living alone, but unfortunately I'm still driving out there using those wonderful disability spots. 
But I now have an adorable cat. Now, if you're looking at pets and you love cuddly dogs or something, you know, just remember that you have to get up in the morning and you have to take that dog out on a leash. And in the evening, you have to also take the dog out on a leash and walk the dog. And if you don't do that, the dog will let you know. Sometimes not in a very pleasant way. <laughs> but with a cat, oh, it is so handy. A cat gets used to a litter box. And all you have to do is put the bowl of food in the bowl of water and the litter box and then make your lap available and you're all set with a cat. Now, I have an adorable Siamese, and uh, the Siamese loves to be in my lap. In fact, her idea of heaven is for me to sit all day in a chair with her on my lap. And sometimes she crawls up and snuggles, you know. It's, it's very warm and comforting to have that cat. And I'll have to admit, in the evenings, she curls up on the bed right next to me. And she purrs and she purrs, and it gives me a warm, fuzzy feeling. So if it's possible for any of your clients to have a cat, I just recommend having a companion cat, because that is really a lot of comfort. So uh, these are just little things that sometimes add to the comfort of a person. But most of all, I think one of the most difficult things that some seniors face is isolation. Now, fortunately for me, because I have been so active in my life, uh, even though I can't write all the checks now for buying tables at galas, I have a lot of younger lawyer friends whose firm buy a table to everything that they have to fill up. So they always want me to do a favor and come join their table, which is a lot of fun. So I keep going out probably more than I should because I'm allegedly writing a book. Uh, and I'm not writing it as fast <laughs> as I'm because I'm going out too much. But for some seniors, they don't have that kind of a situation. And they need to be able to have group activities. They need to be able to have new friendships, not just with seniors. It's good to have intergenerational friends. So some of my best friends now are 90, but some of my other best friends are 50 and 60, and we just have so much fun. Because you don't want to just get locked in at one level and limit yourself to a decreasing number of friends that goes on continually. So you need to be able to have younger friends that you can continue to interact with as you get to be an older person. So those are just some things that are good to think about and to help uh, persons who might be living alone and not as happy by living alone, but needing warmth and comfort and in a safe place. Now, I am fortunate. In my case, I have, a wonderful, I have two wonderful daughters, one of whom is out of town, but not too far away, but one of whom is in town. And she has now assumed the role of mother of it all, you know. And so I'm trying to keep her in bay, at bay because I still am driving my car very happily. I'm still doing all my decision making about what I want to do. And uh, she still hovers now. She hovers a little bit. So, uh, but in a way, it's nice. She calls, you know, when I've been out in the evening having a good time somewhere, she calls just to be sure I got home. And she does some things like that. So it's good that you may not feel you need any protection, 
but it's kind of nice to know that somebody out there cares. And so setting up networks of somebody to look in on senior persons just to be sure everything's okay is a very important thing. Well, I've told you some of the challenges, some of the joys of getting older. I should talk more about joys because there are so many joys. The joy of not having to feel you have to do everything for everybody. Uh, being able to enjoy, if you love reading, I love to read. If you like music, whatever kind of music, I like jazz. <laughs> I do have to say, regretfully, I don't dance anymore, and I used to really like to dance, but anyway, uh, I do enjoy the music. Jazz Alive is this weekend, by the way, the San Antonio Parks Foundation, free event at Travis Park, starting at noon each day and going up till late in the evening. So that is available to go to, bring blankets, but don't bring your own soft drinks because the Parks Foundation will be selling beverages to try to get take care of their overhead and the music that they furnish. But anyway, there's lots of free entertainment, things that you can do and enjoy. Modest charges for museum memberships, but free days. If you don't even want to be a member, you can go on the free days. So much to do, and it's just reaching out and staying connected with your community. Well, let me thank you for this little opportunity I've had to share some thoughts with you. And uh, I just thank you for each one of you for what you do to try to help seniors as they move through this inevitable part of life of getting older. It ain't all bad. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mrs. Cockrell. That was inspiring. I was going to see if she needed a geriatric care manager, but now I may offer her a job. <laughs> oh, good. Okay, great. Dr. Winokur is uh, thanking her and giving her a copy of his book, so, um, which if you haven't read, you need to. So I'll quickly say something about Dr. Winokur, if you don't know him. Uh, Gerald Winokur graduated from the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine. Uh, he completed his residency here uh, at the University of Texas in internal medicine, uh, practiced internal medicine and geriatric medicine in San Antonio for 36 years. He must have see, see all these people. They must have started when they were in preschool. <laughs> he uh, is a clinical professor at UT, uh, UT Health Science Center uh, and an associate faculty manager, member at the Center for Medical Humanities and Ethics, where he helps teach the core curriculum. And his wife, the poet laureate, the lawyer poet, sorry, Lee Robinson, uh, teach their course Medic Medicine Through Literature. Uh, in 2005, Dr. Winokur wrote an essay uh, which appeared in um, Health Affairs and the Washington Post entitled, What Are We Going to Do with Dad? Uh, it was syndicated across the, uh, the US, um, his, leading to interviews on the Diane Rehm Show, uh, Terry Gross uh, with Fresh Air. Um, <coughs> and ultimately his book, of course. Um, and then uh, he has uh, currently authors a quarterly column on aging and geriatric medicine uh, for the Journal of American, oh, JAMDA, sorry, Journal of American, American Medical Directors. American Medical Directors, thank you, American Medical Directors, sorry. Um, uh, Caring for the Aging is the title of that. Um, he speaks often and well, so uh, better than I do, so I'm gonna <laughs> hand it over to Dr. Winokur, thank you.
Well, I tell you, it's a pleasure to be here. I want to thank uh, the committee and Dr. Saunders and Mark for inviting me. Uh, uh, Mayor Cockrell's a hard act to follow. Um, my talk is going to be on resilience in aging. And if she isn't a stellar example of that, I don't know who is. I'm going to talk to you about some, some other uh, 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 aging individuals who've, who've done well, but she's right up there. Um, so uh, I'm here today to talk about several interrelated subjects that during my many years as a practicing geriatrician, uh, I, uh, I often contemplated. Uh, and these subjects are, what is successful aging? What do we mean when we use the term resilience? And what is creative resilience? Um, So I got interested in this, in this uh, area uh, in the main because of the work that I did all these years. You know, I watched my patients and myself uh, age over the last 40 years, and I, I had to keep asking, why, why did some of my patients do so well and live so long, despite the fact that they had multiple comorbidities? Uh, what, what's happening here? It can't just be genetics. It can't just be immunology or lifestyle or herbal supplements. You know, as a doctor, I had sort of a, a disease-oriented approach to things. Uh, it was the cancer or the heart failure or the dementia that finally took my patient. But, but there's much more to it than that, I've come to believe. Um, those of us that care for patients uh, and have seen a lot of patients over our practice careers, we have this feeling that we can, we can pretty much sit down with someone for, uh, for just a few minutes and identify whether or not that individual is aging well. Um, that's not really true, but I, I want you to look at some photographs of some folks that were, that were taken by... Um, my friend Jeff Levine, who's a geriatrician and a wonderful photographer, whose exhibit uh, Aging Across America came to San Antonio a few years ago. Uh, he, he's taken wonderful photographs, really over his lifetime, of, of aging folks. And I want to show a few of them to you today. And I want you to look at these people and say, well, do you think they're aging well or not aging well? Well, I'd say this fellow is aging pretty well, isn't he? I mean, look at him there on his, on his horse in, in a rodeo. He's obviously a white-haired gentleman. There's a couple of elderly Tom Udick scholars studying together, seem to be very intent on their work. So what, what is successful aging? There have been a lot of studies on this, and there's a lot of definitions. And um, let me just go through some of the definitions for successful aging. Well, obviously, the ability to function independently is, is, a, is an important definition, and we just saw in Mayor Cockrell an excellent example of that. In the absence of physical impairments, the upper 20% of individuals who retain the most vigorous physical functioning, the absence of physiological decline, having no more than one disease with high physical function, being free of cardiovascular disease, cancer, chronic lung disease, or emphysema with intact physical and cognitive function, being in the top tertile of physical and cognitive function. These are all definitions that researchers have used to, to try to tell us what is successful aging. But if you, if you think about this, about these definitions, you see that they tend to focus only on physiological aging. Um, as barriers, uh, and, and we tend to still look at aging as unidimensional uh, rather than multidimensional. So there's really no consensus on what is a standard definition of successful aging. 
So I said to myself when I was thinking about this topic, well, well, let's look at centenarians, people that live to be 100 years old. I mean, that's, I mean, we're all trying to get to that magic number. Let's, let's, let's live to be 100. I mean, that, that's a driving force behind all the money our country spends on aging research. So let's look at centenarians. There's a bunch of studies on centenarians. And when you look at centenarians, you find that 40 to 50 percent of centenarians are demented. A third need assistance to eat, half to toilet, two-thirds to dress. The, the mean number of chronic illnesses was 4.3. And it turns out that really only a minority, 12 percent, of centenarians are non-demented and functioned well physically and living at home. So uh, centenarian studies have showed us that it's, it's inherently difficult, if not impossible, to reach advanced age, yet still remain free of comorbidities and some degree of disability. And yet, and yet, and this is the key, despite these changes, functional adaptation and autonomy may still be attainable. So we all age different, differently. There are multiple pathways to successful aging. And I, I want to spend a couple minutes talking about some of the conceptions and misconceptions that all of us, healthcare professionals as well as laypersons, constantly hear and read about. And I'm talking about tonics and potions and cure-alls uh, that are out there to delay aging and all the, all the literature there is surrounding some of these um, and what we can do uh, or not do to maintain the health of our own brains. So at this point, uh, here is what we can say about these so-called preventative strategies to, um, to brain health. Um, individuals who exercise regularly and maintain cardiovascular conditioning have without a doubt, a lower risk of Alzheimer's disease. As far as diet goes, adequate intake of folic acid and, and, and uh, green leafy vegetables is where those, uh, we get a lot of our folic acid as well as other good things. Um, low saturated fat and high fruit and vegetable consumptions, this Mediterranean style diet that you've all heard about, they've all been found useful in prevention. Indeed, the diet and exercise component of a prevention program has proven to be at least as effective as medications commonly used to treat Alzheimer's disease. There are some other dietary factors, such as omega-3 fatty acids. Several studies show an association, at least, with reduced risks for uh, cognitive decline with a high omega-3 fatty acid diet. Vitamin E, which has always um, which has always been touted as helpful, really uh, there's no evidence that this, that this uh, changes the onset of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, ginkgo biloba that a lot of you have heard about and can buy over the counter, there's no evidence that this helps either. I don't have this on the slide, but there's a recent large study that was published showing that vitamin D in high doses uh, may well be helpful in delaying the onset of dementia um, uh, I wouldn't go out and start taking vitamin D if you're not already on it for, um, for bone health uh, and because the doses that they recommend are rather high, somewhere in, in the 5,000 international units per day of vitamin D, and um, that can cause other issues. But certainly those of you that are on it for bone health or ought to be on it for bone health, uh, particularly post-menopausal women, uh, it's probably is somewhat helpful with uh, the delay of onset of dementia. There's a host of other medicines that a lot of us take, um, such as conjugated estrogens. They do not protect against Alzheimer's. Uh, Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory uh, drugs, a lot of us take ibuprofen and those sorts of things. There's actually, an, 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 there's actually a suggestion that, act, that those actually increase the incidence of Alzheimer's disease, but the trials were limited and flawed. Um, there are some spices that are being uh, 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 tested now as anti-inflammatory. Results are obviously not, not uh, are forthcoming. Uh, estrogens plus progesterones, 
A lot of women are on those as they age. Two trials suggest actually an increased incidence of dementia, including Alzheimer's disease. Alcohol, heavy drinking, increases progression to cognitive impairment. The folks who drink in moderation seem to do better than those who abstain completely. So go on and have your glass of wine with dinner. Uh, smoking, uh, current, current smoking history is associated with an increased risk of cognitive decline. Uh, the evidence for smoking in the past, years past, is less consistent. Uh, modifiable medical conditions, um, uh, untreated or inadequately treated high blood pressure, hypertension, and or diabetes has consistently been associated with cognitive decline, uh, as has uh, high cholesterol, elevated LDL, uh, are also associated with a greater risk for Alzheimer's disease. But there's information now coming to the fore that the drugs that doctors commonly use to treat elevated LDL cholesterol, these statin drugs, you know them, Lipitor and, and uh, Crestor, and um, there are several of them now. They've also been associated with cognitive impairment, and our elderly patients on them ought to be reevaluated about whether or not they are there to be continued. Uh, depression and anxiety are consistently linked to mild cognitive impairment, the earliest detectable stage of dementia and cognitive decline. Uh, citalopram, which is one of these SSRI antidepressant drugs, um, has been shown to reduce amyloid production in the brain. But, you know, amyloid, we know, accumulates in the brains of our patients with Alzheimer's disease. But, but it's, uh, it really remains to be seen if that's uh, a cause of the disease or a, um, or, um, uh, a byproduct of other processes going on that's causing the disease. But what about these memory exercises that we're all encouraged to do? Um, there's been a one large randomized, randomized trial of cognitive training over about six weeks uh, that did demonstrate a modest benefit on cognitive functioning and a very small effect on reducing the extent of age-related cognitive decline at five-year follow-up. So things like uh, brain boot camp and um, uh, Luma, uh, Lumosity, to name just two programs to exercise brain function, may help, uh, if only to ease the frustration of those of us worried about our memories. Um, w whether, whether they're going to improve memory that's going to be sustained uh, it really remains to be determined. And another important aspect of things that I'm going to talk more about is, is social and cognitive engagement. Just like Mayor Cockrell was talking about, you know, there is a significant association between the loss of a spouse and cognitive decline. And never having been married and having a low social support system puts one at increased risks for Alzheimer's disease. But maintaining these connections, as we'll talk about, can be very important. So, um, no magic potion, really, that we can put our fingers on to, to to help our, our brains continue to function. But where else can we maybe look for help? So th this is what I really want to talk about today, which is um, some of the compensatory psychosocial mechanisms on aging. Um, because I believe that with these mechanisms, utilizing some of these mechanisms, we can compensate for our other deficits that we're going to develop as we age and that we don't really have much control over. So let's look at some of these things. Uh, emotional vitality, resilience, which we're going to talk about also in more detail, coping, optimization, spirituality, and social ties. So in, in the model that I want to talk about this morning, psychosocial and uh, or social mechanisms help us compensate for the physiological decline that's going to be inevitable as we age. Um, here's, here's a model. There are three domains here. The physiological domain, disease and impairment. The psychological domain, which is sometimes talked about as emotional vitality. And the sociological domain, which, which is engaging with life and as well as with spirituality. 
So in this model, successful aging is the state wherein an individual is able to invoke adaptive psychological and social mechanisms to compensate for the physiological limitations that he or she may have developed to achieve the sense of well-being and high self-assessed quality of life and a sense of personal fulfill fulfillment. Um, it's these areas of overlap that are most important. Um, so I mentioned resilience in this model. What, what, is, what is resilience? Who is, a, who is a more resilient elderly individual? This is one of my favorite pictures of Dr. Levine's. You see, um, you see this, is his, this is this gentleman's grandson. This is a former Tuskegee Airman. I think he went to their annual convention to take this, the annual gathering to take this photograph. And you see an elderly gentleman. He's got his grandson behind him, with him, supporting him. Uh, is that, is he resilient just by that connection with his grandson? What about this lady? I mean, at first glance, this is a, this is a woman on the streets of New York City with the sign that says, raising money for medical bills. And at, at first glance, you might think, well, this is very sad, isn't it? Very sad photograph. But look at her. There she is playing the harmonica. She's got her walker all decorated with little angels. She's got her sign and her collection box. I mean, that's a pretty resilient individual, isn't it, when you think about it? Um, uh, maybe as resilient as, as Mayor Cockrell. I mean, there she is, all set up. She's got her, she's got her little place. Um, so what, what, is, what do we mean by resilience? You know, it's a, it's a, it's a concept that's been around a, a long time, but most of the real work on, on resilience has been done just in the last 10 years or so. And um, uh, let me give you a kind of a working definition, uh, which comes from this book, uh, Resilience and Aging, if any of you are interested in really getting into this in, in detail. Um, uh, and I have a, a very small contribution to this book. But anyway, a definition from this book is that resilience is conceptualized to reflect an effective response to some type of adversity or challenge, whether it be physical, psychological, economic, political, environmental, or social. Um, and there, there actually are scales to measure some of these things. One of them is this Wagnelled resilience scale. And um, uh, they developed a scale by interviewing many individuals who groups of researchers felt were, resi uh, were resilient, and they identified certain themes. And I don't, I don't want to um, spend a lot of time on this because there's other things I want to cover. Older adults have life experiences that result in significant strengths and capabilities, allowing for successful coping with the multiple adversities they may encounter. So, Resilience encompasses a developmental, it's really a developmental process of being mindful and prioritizing those behaviors, thoughts, and feelings that facilitate contentment within a specific developmental, physical, emotional, and spiritual context. Um, one of the things that we want this work on resilience to lead to is to really be able to identify interventions for our, um, for our elderly countrymen uh, that are going to tap in to some of, the, some of these um, uh, other um, strengths and capabilities that, that they might have that will enhance their resilience and facilitate their aging. And one of the things we can do is to uh, involve our elders and tap into what is called their creative resilience. Um, this is just coming into its own, the study of this. 
you know, there's lots of anecdotal evidence that creativity can continue well into our oldest years and that exercising the parts of our brain responsible for our creativity uh, enhances our daily lives and keeps our mind sharp and supple. Um, the scientific basis, what's actually going on in the brain, the brain chemistry, as it were, uh, it, that's still in its infancy. But it does appear that folks, even with mild to moderate dementias, can not only participate in creative acts that bring them fullness and joy, it can also appreciate um, the creative acts of others in a way and to a, to a degree that we have not heretofore realized. I want to give you some examples of the creative powers of, of some well-known members of our species. And I take uh, a lot of these examples from this book by Gene Cohen, who, uh, who uh, is, a for, is a founding director of the National Institute of Aging and, are, and really a groundbreaking researcher in this whole field. So does anybody recognize this famous chapel and who designed it? So that's the Dominican chapel designed by Henri Matisse. He, he designed the stained glass for this chapel when he was 82 years old. Here he is, even, even bedridden, he continued to paint. Anyone know who painted this? So that's a Renoir. Uh, uh, he was unable to walk as he neared 70. His fingers weren't supple, but he continued painting, attaching a paintbrush to his hand. This uh, famous painting, Washerwomen, was created when he was 76. Uh, Mary Cassatt, an American Impressionist, uh, painted this at the age of 64, not that we consider that old anymore. Uh, who did this painting? So this is Grandma Moses, Anna Mary Robertson Moses. Was born in 1860 and lived to be 101. And she did not begin to paint until she was in her late 70s and produced 1,600 canvases over her three-decade career as a painter. There she is. Many of you probably recognize this as the Guggenheim Museum in New York City, designed by Frank Lloyd Wright. Uh, he was 91 years old when he completed the drawings for this museum. And. Uh, just to take some people for some other, from some other fields, Albert Einstein, uh, he was 74 when he published uh, his paper on the meaning of relativity, which included uh, his controversial unified field theory. He once said, imagination is more important than knowledge. This is a famous writer. This is Dame Agatha Christie. She wrote up until she died at age 86. Her books have sold more than 100 million copies. This is Leo Tolstoy, who lived to be 82 and was productive until the end. Robert Frost, a famous American poet, published In the Clearing at age 88. And a couple of figures from the medical field, that's Albert Schweitzer. He got the Nobel Peace Prize for his work as a medical missionary in Africa at age 77. Uh, those of you who are nurses probably know who this is. That's Florence Nightingale. Um, she, um, uh, she said this, which we should have listened to a long time ago. It may seem a strange principle to enunciate as the very first requirement in a hospital that it should do the sick no harm. Uh, anyway, at age 88, uh, oh, there, that's her quote. At age 88, she, um, she uh, was awarded the honorary freedom of the city of London, and she established this school of nursing at that time. Um, this is Gene Cohen, uh, who authored that, the book I mentioned before, and his dad playing cribbage together when his dad was 91. And he said, creative potential is there in all of us, an inner resource, renewable and vibrant, 
no matter how much or how little it is used. This creative spirit has the power to change our lives at every age and to do so in quite different ways as we get older. Uh, a couple more quotes from, um, from Dr. Cohen. Creativity strengthens our morale in later life. It allows us to alter our experience of problems and sometimes to transcend them in later life. It makes us more emotionally resilient and better able to cope with life's adversity and losses. And he has some wonderful, some, some, uh, some other wonderful things that he says that, that it also contributes to our physical health and a positive outlook and sense of well-being have a beneficial effect on the functioning of our immune system and overall health. And that it's our greatest legacy. Adult children with optimistic expectations of aging typically are more comfortable discussing aging and other life passages with their parents. And creativity is our greatest legacy. So, you know, at some level, all of us know this. Uh, but if we, if we look around objectively at the world we're living in today, especially uh, in uh, industrialized Western societies, um, we look around and we see a rising ageism in our culture. And I think all of us could agree that that is happening. Um, and Gene Cohn commented on this and said, uh, creativity has always been there with aging, but many have not recognized or searched for it in themselves in later life because society has so denied, trivialized, or maligned it with advancing years. And I think all of us that are reaching our older years have experienced some of that. Um, he also had a message for uh, policymakers. Um, to recognize the potential for creative expression independent of age is more likely to bring policymakers to the table, not with a sense of skepticism or worse cynicism about what is possible, but with a new sense of opportunity, challenge, and one hopes creativity. To think about older adults primarily in terms of decline and disability or to view them as a national burden is to overlook their value as a national resource of exceptional potential. Um, as, uh, as Byron mentioned, uh, I've been teaching uh, at the medical school for a number of years now, and um, one of the things I, I like to, to uh, teach our medical students is how important patient stories are to, uh, to, understand their, to understand them in a holistic sense. We all have a unique story to tell. Um, of our life, uh, of the lives of our families, both in sickness and in health. And I want to spend just a few minutes telling you a bit about my own family, uh, the one I know best, obviously, and um, uh, for the purposes of my talk today on creative resilience, I believe the story of my dad is instructive. So here we are about 12 years before our troubles with my dad began. That's that's uh, my mom and me and my father, my brother, Mike. Um, when I was a child, that's me, about age two. When I was a child, I remember distinctly crawling into my father's lap, holding a pencil and a piece of paper or a notebook. And I would say to him, to him draw a dog daddy or, or draw a tree or a bird. And he did it. It was an amazing thing for me to watch, just a few death strokes and there it was, and I, I thought it was magic in those days, those figures coming to life on the paper through my dad's hand. That's something I have never been able to do. Whatever, that, whatever it is he had, whatever talent, I don't have a drop of it. <clears throat> this is the earliest picture of my father that I've ever found, and this was, I found this pretty much recently, and I am pleased to see that he looks like a happy kid at that time in his life. He did spend his life working six-day weeks in a dreary shop that his father had opened. And my, uh, my father's father died when my father was six. Uh, his, his mother was an illiterate immigrant 
who was caught up with her family of six children in the desperate circumstances of the Depression. And she had no choice but to take each child in turn out of school and put them to work in that store. And at age 16, then six months shy of high school graduation, it was my father's turn. And, uh, and except from five years that he spent uh, in the Army Air Corps photographing, photographing ground damage after the bombers made their runs, uh, that shop became his life. And I remember all through my childhood, there was an easel in our basement. There it is behind, uh, behind our dog. Uh, it just gathered dust. I mean, he never painted. I never saw him paint anything. Um, when I was a teenager, there I am as a teenager, um, I work with my dad uh, every day after school and on Saturdays. And, um, and every summer. And I remember this story distinctly. We were driving home one night late after a busy day, and he said, out of the blue to me, you know, when I was in junior high about your age, I had an art teacher who took an interest in me. He sent me home with a note from my mother. She beat me before I could read it to her. I guess she must have thought I'd gotten into some kind of trouble, <clears throat> and she didn't need any more trouble. Anyway, when she finally let me read her the note, it said that this teacher wanted me to go to the Maryland Institute of Art. He'd made sure I got in, and then it wouldn't cost anything. And, you know, I was, I was a kid, but I, I was moved in some way that I didn't quite understand, and, and my voice caught, and I remember saying, so what did Granny say? There's Granny. Nothing, he said. She tore up the note and walked away. So my dad didn't have an easy life. He was lucky to have survived the war. He worked six-day weeks eking out a living in, in, his, in his dad's store. And he suffered a major depression when Granny died when he was in his early 40s. And then he finally lost his business when he was 49 years old and he fell into another long depression. His wife, my mother, uh, actually came to work for me. I was in practice at that time and supported him the rest of his life. But in his 60s, my father began to paint. One day that old easel appeared in a clearing in the garage and he set up a series of lights and a table on which to place his study subjects and he started going to the library almost every day and taught himself art history, returning each evening and talking to my mother about the lives of Renoir and Monet and Picasso and so, and these paintings began to flow from his studio, the roses and irises from his garden, self-portraits and paintings of his family members done from memory or with the help of old photographs. His work encompassed every phase of modern art, from the impressionist through the cubist and abstract expressionist. He spent hours in the museum studying how each artist applied the paint to the canvas. He experimented with sand and straw and watercolors and oils and pastels. And I began to hang his works in my medical office, which gave him immense pleasure. My patients would exclaim over them. They wanted to buy them. And he occasionally would give one away, but he couldn't bring himself to sell any. I'm just a piker, he would say. I don't know what I'm doing. And once, uh, without his knowledge, I entered one of his oil paintings in a contest. Uh, and took him to the gallery where all the works were to be hung after judging. And, and there was his painting, Wild Wren, this painting, a white and gold ribbon hanging from the frame. He had won the competition, and I never saw him more ebullient than on that day. His painting went on for about 20 years, but then his health began to fail. He had a couple of heart attacks and then prostate cancer, and he continued to paint some, but I noticed that the works were changing, the perspective dimming, the faces on the portraits less realistic. And then he painted no more. I talked to him, tried to cajole him back into his studio. He would shrug his shoulders and say, I just don't know what to paint anymore. Could I have done more to encourage his creative resilience? Would this have made a difference in what followed? And I don't know the answer. 
But soon came the time when I realized he could no longer sign his name. The day came when I had my own story to tell, and I was by then almost 60 years old. And it became my story because I was not the doctor to the patient, but rather his son. And my father, sick and disabled and demented, could no longer tell his own story. And I realized at some point during his decline, uh, as his son, the geriatrician, I had to tell his story because it would help me, my family, and I hope many others. Uh, one night, just past my father's 80th birthday, my mom called me in a panic. I don't know what's wrong, she said. He's pacing through the house, saying he needs air. He's all agitated. And I rushed over there. He was in congestive heart failure, and I called his doctor, one of my younger associates, who said, I'll meet you in the emergency room. Hard to get a doctor to do that these days. And this was the beginning of a seven-year siege for my family and the beginning of the end of my dad's story. You know, it started in this, in this hospital where I made rounds every day for almost four decades, and no one made any mistakes, and he received excellent care. His heart failure stabilized, but in the hospital, he developed delirium, which you know is an acute agitation and anxiety. And and disorientation and, and although I stayed with him every minute and got him out of there as soon as I could his dementia had been unmasked and he was never the same after that the days and, and months difficult days and months continued and I struggled with his meds and his incontinence and my mother's concerns and complaints and frustrations her devotion and her fatigue his confusion and paranoia and his falls his struggles to stay upright and independent in the world, his loss of appetite, his inability to recognize his own son, and, and his slow dying by degrees. And as many of you know, I, I wrote about his illness in this book, as well, as well as about some of my life as a geriatrician. And my interest in creative resilience really arose out of this experience. After his hospitalization for failure, heart failure, and delirium, he was never the same. His decline was inexorable, but I discovered this. <clears throat> when I visited him, even during the worst of times, uh, when he was paranoid or belligerent even, if I pulled out one of his old art books and sat down next to him, the book opened across our laps and, and, and began to turn the pages, he would become engrossed. Oh, I've always loved that one, he might say. And at the time, I was heartened and amazed at this simple act of sitting with my father while he looked at these famous paintings that had thrilled and inspired him over his lifetime could transform him, alter his mood completely, calm his agitation and belligerency. I was not then aware of the scientific work that was slowly building that I reviewed with you earlier. Um, there is now a lot of converging research that shows that artistic engagement can, uh, can be an important tool for improving quality of life and diminishing these problem behaviors, uh, many of which we, we doctors tend to over-medicate, uh, and even improve some aspects of, of cognitive functioning in individuals with dementia. And these artistic ende endeavors include drawing, music, and dance. Um, I just want to say a few words, and I'm going to skip over a lot of this, um, uh, about this uh, Meet Me at the MoMA program. The, Metropol the, uh, the Museum of Modern Art in uh, New York started a program a number of years ago now that brought together caregivers along with uh, their, their, into their uh, charges. Some of these caregivers were professional caregivers, others were family members their charges who were demented. And they brought them together and they used the collection of the, of the, of the art gallery and they presented um, uh, paintings, uh, three paintings per session. And they, and they talked about them. And it was amazing what some of the people there who were not very communicative at all would say 
at, when they were interviewed after they went through this experience of looking at this art, the artwork. Um, I want to just give you some, give you a few uh, quotes. Starry Night. I think I went. I think I went by that awful fast. But you all know this famous painting. Oh. Uh, after viewing the Starry Night, Elaine Gold said this: "The houses look like they were very close to each other, and it touches you deeply. There's a life force in it, like something being born." And after seeing this painting, uh, Bella Fogel said she was thrilled to see the lion. And Ruth Krauss said, after seeing this painting, Picasso was a study of distortion. So uh, Francesca Rosenberg, who was really responsible for putting this program together, no said, she noticed that these people seemed to have an awakening, that they were coming alive before her eyes. And for many of them, they were able to make connections to memories and thoughts that they hadn't been able to get hold of for a very long time. So that's one of my dad's uh, paintings. But art can tap into one's long-term emotional memories. And Looking at art puts the patient and the caregiver on a level playing field. Both can engage with the work. Um, so these programs are popping up all over the country. In fact, uh, uh, the McNay has a program like this. So you might think about that if you have patients or no patients that you think might benefit from uh, getting involved in this. Um, and they're, they're doing some, some excellent academic work at the New York NYU Center of Excellence for Brain Aging and Dementia Study. So there, there's actually academic work coming out of these, these, uh, these, these experiences. Um, some other stuff I want to skip over. And I want to mention one other thing. Music therapy, since the early 2000s, it's been known that, that music in patients with dementia can decrease irritability and, and actually improve, cause, show, showed some improvement on the, one of the scales we use to measure the level of dementia, the MMSE scale. Um, and uh, I want to show a short video to you to now. And some of you have probably seen it because this short video that I came across a number of years ago has been made into a, into a documentary movie that many of you have seen. It's called Alive Inside. The older physician in the film is Dr. Oliver Sacks, who some of you might recognize as the famous neurologist who was featured in the movie Awakenings. So can we, can we show that now? I 
gonna take the meter for one second, okay? I'm gonna ask you a few questions. Okay? I'm gonna give it back to you. Okay, so that's really a, an amazing, an amazing video. It's uh, you can get it on YouTube. Um, so I just want to, I, I want to just say one more thing. Um, you know, my uh, my dad's gone now eight years, and I think of him every day. You know, I cursed that disease that stole, stole his selfhood, and I, uh, I was literally brought to my knees on the day he could no longer remember my name. But, you know, he was 87 years old by then. And with nature and nurture arrayed against him, I have to conclude that he was, in the end, saved by his art, because the practice of his art gave him a new identity. He was no longer a failed shopkeeper. He was an artist. And the message for all of us is that when we are failing physically and cognitively, dipping into the well of our personal creative resilience can buoy us. So thank you very much for your attention this morning. <laughs> Sentirme un poquito. 